Professor John Coffey. Professor Coffey really needs no introduction to those of us who uh, practice law in the United States and probably doesn't need introduction uh, for those of you who practice law around the world, but I will anyway. Uh, he is the Adolph Burl Professor of Law at Columbia Law School and the director of the Center on Corporate Governance. By any measure, he is one of the most influential law professors and lawyers in the United States. He has published uh, widely and been cited widely. Um, he has testified numerous times before both the United States House of Representatives and the United States Senate. Um, Possibly the best indication that he is not only influential in the law of the United States, but in the life and culture of the United States, is that in 2011, he was asked to be um, the featured guest on The Daily Show, uh, which many of you probably know is a very, very popular, or was a very, very popular late night uh, comedy talk show. Um, most important of all, he is a friend of this conference. Um, he has uh, been here before. Uh, he has also uh, written a special piece uh, for the conference that can be found on its website. So please give a warm welcome back to Professor John Coffey. Thank you. By this time of the day, you are overloaded. You have heard facts, theories, cases, statutes, new proposals, old proposals, codes that may or may not come into effect soon, and I don't think you can absorb too much more. You're saturated. Therefore, uh, I'm not going to skip giving you new information, but I'm going to try to make it a little bit more interactive. I'm going to suggest that I will cut my talk a little bit short and invite questions. And if I don't get questions, I'll call on law professors I know to see if they are prepared. Uh, in any event, I want to make things a little bit more interactive. Okay. Uh, also, while I have, oh, by the way, because um, I'm going to discuss some pending cases that are still being intensely argued, and some people out in the audience are litigating these cases, let me just say with respect to pending cases, Chatham House rules apply. I don't want to say anything that will be cited in any court, any place, in connection with the, this talk. You'll notice up here one line I want to focus on. Lord Deming uh, said this in 1983. He was a very cogent, lucid English judge, uh, and he said something that still applies with considerable force. Uh, As a moth is drawn to the light, so is a litigant drawn to the United States. You've heard earlier today why. The U.S. has got opt-out classes, it permits contingent fees, it has no loser pays rule, it generally has juries. Cases don't get to the jury, but you bargain in the shadow of the law, and there's a jury out there which adds great unpredictability, so that affects the settlement negotiations. And there may be punitive damages in a few cases at least. All of those things are pro-plaintiff, and plaintiffs typically choose the venue. So that's the basis for Lord Denning's quite correct observation. But what I'm going to focus on today, I can get my clicker phone working. Let's see if this will work. And I just managed to turn it off. How did I do that? All right. Uh, uh, is the Morrison case and the reaction to it? Uh, now, the orientation of this program today has been at a very high intellectual level, kind of the meta level of broad principles, broad breaststrokes. I'm going to get a little bit more granular and down to how cases are actually structured and how they proceed. Uh, I'm focusing on this sort of question. How do litigators who are basically intelligent, strategic, and not a little entrepreneurial, in cooperation with judges, find ways to structure a global resolution, or at least a multi-jurisdiction resolution, when there has been a major obstacle placed in their path that they want to outflank and get around. That major obstacle that I'm talking about is a case called Morrison versus National Australia Bank, decided in 2010. Uh, and Morrison, on its facts, involved what was called an F-cubed class action. You've heard all kinds of strange phrases, but an F-cubed class action, F stands for foreign, uh, means that, because it's cubed, there were foreign plaintiffs, foreign defendants, and all the trading occurred outside the United States and was foreign also. Foreign in all dimensions, 
Why did that belong in the United States? Probably it didn't. Everybody thought the case was likely to be reversed, but instead the Supreme Court came down with a sweeping reversal. Uh, and the case, Morrison, essentially destabilized the world of securities litigation by, by withdrawing the U.S. as a forum for global settlement. And the U.S. had been a very happy forum for global settlement in prior years. Uh, the decision reversed what was the U.S.'s prior rule, which was called the conduct or effect test, which said uh, that if either fraudulent conduct had occurred in the United States or the effect of these statements had affected trading in the U.S., then the anti-fraud provisions of the U.S. securities laws would apply. Reversing that, Morrison said that the anti-fraud provisions of the U.S. federal securities laws reached only transactions that occurred in the United States. Thus, if a stock was cross-listed on both the U.S. exchange and an exchange in Canada, Israel, or uh, the United Kingdom, the claims of those who purchased on the foreign exchange could seemingly not be heard before a U.S. court. Now, because few other jurisdictions uh, permit a U.S.-style opt-out class action, that meant that many claimants who previously had settled in the United States were denied a forum to which they could get a settlement from. Uh, and particularly European and British institutional investors didn't want that. They wanted to find a way around that. I'd also tell you more generally, this is an old principle of science, that nature abhors a vacuum. And efforts soon began to fill the void that Morrison created. One of my generalizations here is that vacuums may be very short-lived phenomena because we're now seeing a number of ways in which that vacuum is being filled. filled. So this short piece, uh, by the way, there's a written version of this piece that's much longer than these slides, and it's posted somewhere on the conference's website, and I'll put it on SSR in a few weeks. Uh, this short piece will compare various techniques that have arisen, most notably the expanded use of settlement classes. All right. Now let's talk first about settlement classes, if I can get this to the right. No, I'll take the questions at the end. Francis, at the end. We'll, we'll never get done. Hmm? Okay. Settlement classes. Uh, the Petrobras solution. Now, in the Petrobras securities litigation, which you've heard referred to several times today, uh, Judge Jed Rakoff certified a class for litigation purposes uh, but the Second Circuit upheld him on seven or eight of the principal issues, but reversed him on one. They reversed him on the issue of whether there was adequate evidence that Petrobras's bonds had actually traded in the United States. The case was primarily about common stock, and that was clear it traded on the U.S. exchanges. But the bonds, where did the bonds trade? They often traded in face-to-face -face transactions. This issue, which is now called domesticity, meaning where is the location of the trade that occurred in the United States, uh, implied that the bonds really couldn't be included in this settlement class because if it was an individual issue as to each bond where it had traded, that destroyed something sacred to U.S. class action law called predominance. Rule 23b3 requires, as you've now heard several times, that the common issues of law and fact must predominate over the individual issues. And if you had to get into where each bond traded, that was an individual issue and you lost predominance. That seemed to mean you couldn't settle these bonds, which was a big part of the overall settlement, not the major part, but a big part. Okay. Uh, nonetheless, the parties went back to the bargaining table, negotiated again, and decided to settle for $3 billion, which as you've heard is the largest foreign settlement in U.S. courts, and it was also the largest settlement in a number of years, uh, okay, and they settled the case for $3 billion and brought it back to Judge Rakoff with the bonds included in the settlement. Judge Rakoff approved this settlement. Now, how could he have done that? How could you approve a settlement which the Second Circuit has just reversed months before the certification on? The answer, Judge Rakoff said, was that domesticity, this issue of where the bonds traded, was a merits issue rather than an issue of subject matter jurisdiction. And Morrison had said, all this stuff is really merits issues, not subject matter jurisdiction issues, and Rakoff took them at his word. I have to add here, because I keep mentioning the name of Judge Rakoff, 
uh, that he and I have taught a seminar now for 31 years, and I don't pretend to know what he thinks on all issues, but I got a general sense of what his disposition is on many questions. Okay, uh, so having said that this was a merits issue, Judge Rakoff said, well, if they want to, the defendants can waive this merits issue, and the result is I can approve the settlement. Now, what that says in effect, and the implications here are quite large, is that you can have a settlement class which is much larger than the litigation class. The litigation class has been framed narrowly. It only covers securities inside the United States, and some of them didn't look like you'd prove that adequately, but still, uh, because you can waive that issue, the settlement class could be much broader than the litigation class. Okay. Now, actually, he didn't expand it much because the settlement class here still required that the bonds had to trade on the depository trust company in New York for clearance purposes. I don't want to get you into how bonds are cleared. You're already, it's already been a long enough day. You don't want to hear about this. But it was only a moderate expansion he engaged in. But it opened up a world of possibilities. Uh, you might have all kinds of expanded classes. For example, suppose Petrobras' securities had traded 50% of the United States and 50% in London. Could Judge Rakoff have approved a settlement that included also the 50% that traded in London, at least for purposes of it being a settlement class rather than a litigation class, if the other party was willing to waive that? And in many of these litigations, the defendant wants a global settlement because defendants have learned over and over that they're being sued all around the world and the next group of claimants start their negotiations where the last settlement just ended. And so it always goes up and up and up in their view and they wanted a global settlement. Okay, the only apparent limit on this question of uh, can you include London in a settlement class with the United States would be whether the expanded claims include claims of fundamentally different legal strengths. Uh, because if there is a fundamental difference in the strength of these claims, you're probably going to have to use subclasses and probably going to have to use independent counsel. And this was all discussed in Rakoff's decision, which has Second Circuit authority behind it already. Okay. The Second Circuit case that Rakoff was relying on was written by Judge Jerry Lynch, who's also a colleague of mine at Columbia. So it's a very incestuous decision between Rakoff, Lynch, and the rest of the place. All right, now, that's one route. I'm talking about ways you can get to settlement and fill the vacuum that Morrison created. A second route is something you've already heard a good deal about. This is the Netherlands White Cam Statute, uh, adopted in 2005, really adopted uh, because of the need to have a remedy for uh, pharmaceutical products that cause birth defects. That was the force that uh, uh, caused that, those events to be set in motion. And Dutch uh, scholars came to the United States to see how they uh, handled major pharmaceutical disasters like thalidomide. And what they learned, and this is an example of cultural misinterpretation, they learned that you didn't need to have actual litigation because these cases settled in the settlement classes. All of those birth defect cases did settle. And so they went back and said, we don't need to have a lawsuit. We just need to approve a settlement class and give it judicial review. That probably was the wrong perception of what you ideally want. Uh, but that's, that's the way the, the statute got adopted in 2005, uh, contemplating that there would only be a settlement class. Now, how can this procedure be used? Well, the way it's been used in several cases, including the Fortis case that you heard discussed, uh, really has two stages. First, groups of plaintiffs organize in what are called stichtings. Pardon my Dutch, it may not be quite accurate, but it literally translates as foundation. Uh, and a stichting is a collective vehicle, has its own board of directors, that has the legal rights to the shares that could settle the claims to the shares. Okay, so they are going to be a vehicle, and you had in many of these cases two, three, or even more stichtings being formed, run by different law firms and legal organizations. Okay, these stichtings start to sue, and as the litigation progresses, the defendants may say it's better to resolve this all at once in a global resolution than have all of these stichtings, and the stichtings are in effect an opt-in small class action but run by different law firms, and they're not coordinated, they're not consolidated, but you have all these little suits coming up against you. So maybe you sit down and say, why don't we talk to these stick chains and see if we can get a 
universal global settlement pursuant to the White Cam statute, and we do that, now we can include all the absent class members all around the world so no one is left to sue us in any other case. That occurs in several cases in the Netherlands uh, prior uh, to this litigation, prior to the Fortis litigation. Uh, the first was probably the Royal Dutch Shell settlement uh, back in 2009. Uh, that settled for at the time was a record settlement, 382 million. This was way back long ago, 2009. That was a big number for Europe then, okay? It included everybody except shareholders in the United States. They had all settled in a U.S. class action, but the U.S. court wouldn't allow the foreign shareholders in because it didn't even meet the conduct or effect test, according to the U.S. court. All right. So we have this Dutch settlement pursuant to the White Camp statute for 382 million. That's before Morrison. After Morrison, we now come to Fortis. Now, let's make sure if I'm keeping up with this. Okay, this is the implications and now uh, the White Camp statute. All right. Uh, after Morrison, we next come to Fortis, which was another product of the 2008 financial crisis. The Fortis settlement. Uh, revealed a recurring problem with settlement classes. That is, often the absent class members are treated less favorably than those more closely associated with plaintiff's counsel. And that happens sadly quite recurrently in the United States. Now in Fortis, as you've already heard, I didn't realize other people were going to discuss this, the settlement sought to pay more to quote active class members. These were class members who had participated in the earlier Stichting litigation, who had been part of the de facto equivalent of an opt-in class action. Okay, they were close to the plaintiffs, the lawyers, and they had been paying or they'd been uh, assembled and solicited long ago, and they were to receive more than these Johnny-come-lately late passive class members who were just going to be in the universal opt-out settlement. To its credit, and I, I congratulate them, the Amsterdam Court of Appeals uh, rejected this disparity and thus forced the settlement to be raised. Uh, the original settlement in Fortis was for $1.33 billion, and it was raised up to $1.5 billion to virtually pay all the same amount. There may have been some remaining differences, but there was a significant increase here in order to get that settlement done on largely equivalent terms. Now this is a recurring problem, and I'm stressing this because if settlement classes, either by the U.S. technique in Petrobras or by the White Cam statute, are going to be much more recurrent, we have to recognize that class members in these kind of settlement classes are really too remote to monitor plaintiff's counsel effectively, and plaintiff's counsel itself has not that much leverage in a settlement class or in a White Cam settlement. As uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote in her famous Ancam Products decision, uh, a plaintiff who in a settlement class who cannot get to trial because it's only a settlement class is effectively disarmed uh, because he cannot get to trial and threaten the defendants with more. And thus there's a question, she wrote, as to whether such a plaintiff can actually provide adequate representation because you are disarmed. Okay. By the way, when she said all that, she cited the humble law professor at Columbia who's before you, uh, but it was her point in any event. Uh, now, uh, that's what's happened through Justice Ginsburg's decision. Now, let's move to the world of cross-listed stocks. I've given you two opportunities, Petrobras and uh, the White Cam statute. Now let's talk three cross-listed stocks in countries. Uh, other jurisdictions have responded to Morrison and responded in somewhat similar but somewhat different ways. Two good examples are Canada and Israel. I'm not just favoring the home team here and mentioning Israel. Israel has one of the largest numbers of cross-listed stocks. I think Canada is first and Israel may be second in terms of the number of stocks that are cross-listed in their country and on the New York or NASDAQ stock exchanges. And they both have legal rules that permit the functional equivalent of the US style opt out class action. So they're in a very similar position to the US. Their responses to Morrison have differed. Let me first take Canada. Uh, the statutory language of the Canadian statute allows you to sue for securities fraud any Canadian company uh, 
in order to cover all its shareholders, regardless of their location anywhere around the world, uh, if the company has been substantially active in uh, the country, in Canada, okay? Uh, so, uh, in the first major case, which was Silver versus IMAX, the U.S. and Canadian judges found that they couldn't get to settlement because the two classes in Canada and the U.S. overlapped. You weren't sure who was in which class, and they were, the, all the class members were sitting back to see which settlement offered a few more dollars before they would commit to which one they were in. To get the cases to settle, the two judges conferred, and they agreed they would split the baby down the middle, a little bit like King Solomon did, uh, and they would say that uh, all of the people who traded in the U.S. would be in the U.S. class action, including the Canadians who traded on the New York Stock Exchange, and all those who traded in Canada would be in the Canadian class action, which gave you a bright line so people couldn't overlap and choose which class they were in. Uh, this was done to protect a settlement that uh, had been entered into the U.S., but they couldn't really implement it and take it to the court unless they had protection against people having their choice of which to be in. I have to say for full disclosure that I was an expert witness for IMAX in that case. Now, the next case, let me move on. Now we have got to YIP. YIP involves HSBC, which as you probably know, was a scandal-plagued bank that did a lot of things that couldn't stand the light of day. Uh, now, Mr. YIP brings a securities class action in Canada, and the court is now forced again to construe this statutory provision that says investors can sue any issuer uh, if the company has a real and substantial connection to Ontario. This is an Ontario provincial statute. Okay. Uh, HSBC Holdings was not listed or traded in Canada, uh, but its major subsidiary, the bank, HSBC, had many branches in Ontario. Uh, was that sufficient? Well, from the standpoint of the corporate world, the court ruled that wasn't sufficient. Uh, that instead you'd have to have a physical presence in the jurisdiction, which HSBC did have, but it had to be accompanied by sustained and substantial business activity. Any other result would have allowed Canadian plaintiffs to sue any company around the world that had one office in Canada or, or Ontario, uh, and that would make Canada sort of the Barbary Coast for securities plaintiffs. Uh, they could reach out from there and reach everything, but that was rejected. Now, most recently, last year, We've got the Leon versus Volkswagen case in Ontario, which I think is also up there. Yeah, uh, plaintiffs sought to sue Volkswagen for the same problem of that defeat device that circumvented emissions control, and they're suing for securities fraud because the stock of Volkswagen went down once this fraud was discovered. Now, although Volkswagen was active in Canada, its securities were not listed or traded there. And the Canadian court said, and I point you to the language that's up here in, in the italics, there is nothing unfair in expecting Ontario residents who purchase a foreign company's shares on a foreign exchange to litigate their claims against this foreign defendant in the jurisdiction of the foreign exchange. In other words, you've got to sue where the stock traded. Okay? Uh, that is essentially Morrison. And you see Canada more or less getting in line with Morrison, possibly because it's right next to a very large neighbor and doesn't want to have inconsistent law that would produce a lot of gaming behavior as U.S. cases try to get brought into Canada. Okay, now there's one exception to this. Despite this expressed preference for basing jurisdiction on the location of the trading, Canadian courts seem also to have recognized one exception that looks to the conduct that actually occurred in the jurisdiction. In this next case, Excalibur, uh, Excalibur Special Opportunities versus uh, Schwartz, Levitsky, Feldman, LLP, the company at issue was a, was a Chinese hog farm. Now, what are Chinese hog farms doing on Canadian markets? Well, they weren't doing much, because actually of the 57 investors, only two were Canadian, only one was Ontario. The rest were Asian or U.S. Uh, investors in a private placement. But they decided, the plaintiffs decided to sue in Ontario because they wanted to sue the accounting firm, Schwartz, Levitsky, and Feldman, which had audited this very fraudulent company, which wound up, like several other Chinese companies of that era, to have totally without assets. Uh, there weren't many hogs on the hog farm. All right, the Canadian court, however, said, because of the conduct here, you can at least sue the auditing firm here. A suggestion 
that Henry Friendly's conduct test is really still alive, at least in Canada. So that if there is fraudulent conduct in the jurisdiction, Canada says you can sue in Canada, uh, but it's got to be real sustained fraudulent behavior, such as a fraudulent audit and very false uh, audit report. Okay, so we have Morrison being followed in Canada, plus a special exception for fraud occurring in Canada. Now let's move to the Israeli position. Uh, Isra Israel has also deferred to the United States with respect to cross-listed stocks, but in a very different way than Canada. And there actually are two cases here. I'll just cite one of them, Cohen versus Tower Semiconductor. The Israeli Supreme Court decided that in the case of a cross-listed issuer, duly listed on NASDAQ and the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, uh, the law governing the disclosure claims in this suit in Israel before the Israeli courts and covering only the stock traded on the uh, Tel Aviv Stock Exchange would be U.S. law. In short, an Israeli judge would be required to apply U.S. law to a transaction in Israel between two Israelis. Uh, Canada would do nothing like that. This is a very different approach in Canada, which would clearly apply Canadian law to a transaction that occurred, a trading transaction that occurred in Canada. Now, why did this happen? It looks like the dominant consideration, you can challenge me on this, but the dominant consideration seems to be the need to have, have one common legal standard applicable to both the U.S. and Israeli actions, so there was an inconsistency between them. And in most cases, the trading in these cross-listed companies is about 75 or 80 percent uh, in the United States, as, as it was in this case. So this is a third route we're saying to how you get to a resolution. Maybe you say, if you trade in the U.S., you've got to have that action heard in the U.S., or maybe you say, here in Israel, we're going to apply U.S. law, even though everything that we're talking about has occurred here in Israel. That last approach surprised me, but it did give us a consistent body of law. Now let's talk about what I think might be the best of these approaches, okay? Supplemental jurisdiction. Under U.S. law, a parallel action over which a U.S. court would not have subject matter jurisdiction can still be heard in a U.S. court if it involves facts closely related to an action before that court over which the U.S. court does have jurisdiction. The test is whether there's the same core nucleus of facts so that you could have a class action uh, in the United States involving people who trade in the United States and you could also have a class action of people who bought the stock in Israel. And that other class action, let's call it a subclass now, could be consolidated, brought into the class as long as it has the same core nucleus of facts. But that's quite easy because securities class actions are always about the same core facts. Was there a material misstatement? Was there a C-enter? And it will be the defendant's conduct that will be common in both those cases. Okay. In these kind of cases, 28 U.S. Code 1367 uh, provides the court the opportunity to pursue complete relief in a federal court lawsuit. And this is what's known a supplemental jurisdiction, or if you're really old, you once heard this called pendant jurisdiction, but only Francis back there is old enough to remember it being called pendant jurisdiction. Okay. Uh, thus, imagine that the British investors who purchased in the UK want to bring a parallel action before the US court because there is no opt-out class action uh, in, the, in the UK, and the US court is already hearing the claims of the US investors, and this is just putting together two cases with somewhat different claimants, but the same basic facts. Now, this idea of parallel actions has been discussed by a number of U.S. academics, probably most notably uh, uh, Professor Buxbaum out of Indiana, uh, but it's only seldom been attempted. And in the one recent case where it's been attempted, it was strongly rejected. It was strongly rejected. In this case, you see at the bottom of the page, in Ray Milan NV securities litigation, okay? Uh, the securities there were traded once again on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, uh, and they wanted to consolidate their action uh, with the U.S. action. This was before Tower versus Semiconductor, and they were applying Israeli law to the Israeli side of the case at that time. But the court said you couldn't do this, and it gave some reasons. Uh, I want to focus on those reasons. In declining to exercise supplemental jurisdiction, 
The U.S. court cited two factors. It said, first of all, there were already parallel class actions pending in Israel, and it didn't want the U.S. courts to sort of poach on those Israeli class actions. A, a fair enough point. Uh, but then it went to a second point, and it said, under 1367 subparagraph C, you can't accept supplemental jurisdiction, or you're not supposed to. It's very discretionary with the court. Uh, you're not supposed to accept supplemental jurisdiction when the case involves, quote, a novel or complex issue of state law. Okay. Now, applying Israeli law probably is a novel and complex issue for a U.S. judge. All right. But that's out of date now. Uh, we now have the Israeli court looking to U.S. law, and U.S. judges are already applying U.S. law to the other half of this case, the case involving the U.S. investors. But and here's the bigger point. The broader policy issue, this court said, in refusing to exercise supplemental jurisdiction was the following. Look at the quote up there. The United States only has a minimal interest, if any, in providing a forum to litigate the claims of foreign stockholders under foreign securities laws. We don't want our case flooded with all these claims that we don't have a strong interest in resolving, it said. Now, but after Tower versus Semiconductor, uh, Israel has ruled that U.S. law will be applicable, and does the U.S. law have a stronger interest if it's a settlement class where there isn't the same burden being placed on the court? Because the settlement class is really just a matter of approving the adequacy and fairness of the settlement and the notice and other issues such as the adequacy of the plaintiff. Okay. Now, in the case of a settlement class that would cover both U.S. and Israeli traders, no additional burden and maybe this global settlement is very important to a U.S. defendant. Here, I want to get to the normative side again and come up with some balancing. How should we balance the promise and peril of settlement classes? As I've suggested to you, that settlement classes often overreach the people who are suddenly included in the expanded class at the 12th hour. 12th hour expansions that bring in a whole host of new plaintiffs are often doing so to make the attorney's fees much higher, but not necessarily give the best outcome for the class members. All right. Uh, now, I would suggest the following safeguards should be considered. When foreign claimants are added to the class, they should be placed in a subclass and represented by independent counsel, presumably from the foreign country, uh, and strong lead plaintiffs. Lead plaintiffs meaning some kind of institutional investor who would be able to be strong enough to resist the attorneys. Small hundred chair plaintiffs are usually quite captured by their attorneys. Okay. A presumption should be recognized that disparities in treatment should be disfavored. Now, that's just what the Amsterdam court did, of course, uh, in the uh, earlier case where they wouldn't allow the distinction uh, in Fortis between the active and the passive shareholders. I also think that comedy should be limited. This is the Canadian experience. Canada has said that we can say that a U.S. court was done procedurally fair enough, but still find that the settlement was so unfair that we will not grant a comedy, which means if we don't grant a comedy, you can sue all over again in Canada, which is the nightmare, the worst possible outcome for the people putting together a settlement class. Now, that still doesn't fully answer the question, should the U.S. become a, should, should want to be a forum for global resolution? even if it's not a great burden, should want to do this. Well, typically, the, ma the majority of the trading in cross-listed stocks is occurring in the U.S., and only in a few cases is the foreign stock more than 25% or so, and you can limit it to those cases. Uh, maybe you shouldn't do this if the U.S. trading is 10% and the foreign trading is 80%. Okay. Uh, settlement classes do not threaten U.S. issues with great liability. The, the case before Morrison that really scared the bar was the case involving Vivendi, the French water company, where a New York jury gave a nine billion, I say again, nine billion recovery against a foreign company that had stock listed on the U.S. exchange. That case was ultimately overturned in light of Morrison, which was decided the next year. But settlement classes don't give rise to gigantic damages because the defendants don't settle if they think this is gigantic damages. They are, they are masters of their own settlement. Okay. Now, what affirmative reasons should we consider? Okay. Let's go back to the friendly rationale. This is, this is the rationale of Henry Friendly, who I characterize as probably the greatest U.S. judge of the last century who didn't serve in the Supreme Court and I might even delete the words who didn't serve on the Supreme Court in terms of overall ability. Uh, 
Henry Fernley reasoned in a series of cases that the U.S. should not be used as a base for fraud. And if you believe that, maybe you do want foreign claimants to be able to sue in the United States if there has been fraudulent conduct in the United States. This would not say all settlement classes should be heard in U.S. courts. It would say those settlement classes in which there appears to be fraudulent conduct in the United States uh, should be susceptible to supplemental jurisdiction. Okay. Next, there's been recent amendments to the U.S. securities laws under which the SEC can now sue foreign corporations for fraud if there was substantial conduct in the U.S. This is we're bringing back the Henry Friendly test uh, simply for giving the SEC jurisdiction. But if the SEC is going to have jurisdiction, as people were pointing out this morning, it's often the case that the recoveries in the private class actions are a multiple, sometimes a high multiple, of the damages the SEC gets. Next, a global resolution is often very much in the interest of U.S. defendants because they're afraid that if they're sued around the world, each next settlement will be at the price of the last settlement, and it just escalates up and up and up. Okay. This limited approach will not bring back the FQ of class action, because I'm trying to insist there at least be fraudulent conduct in the United States, and they will not bring novel cases before courts, because I'm really saying we should start out and try only settlement classes under this procedure, uh, and those cases won't put a burden on U.S. courts, and they're not going to raise the danger of, of tremendous vivendi settlements. Okay. Now, conclusion. Okay. The application of supplemental uh, jurisdiction to foreign law claims is still uncharted. Uh, there are lots of questions, and I think Judge Rakoff's position in Petrobras is probably subject to some outer limits. I'm not sure you can get all of English trading into U.S. courts under his rationale. Nonetheless, the vacuum created by Morrison may be in the process of being partially filled. Securities law cases probably make the best example, the best case for the exercise of supplemental jurisdiction because they naturally share the same operative core facts. They have the same nucleus, whether or not there's a material misstatement, okay? I'm suggesting that two prudential rules be observed. Because it is safest to move marginally, U.S. courts would be well advised to exercise supplemental jurisdiction over foreign law claims only when there has been substantial conduct in the United States and only when there is a settlement class agreed to. Uh, once cases today, if we don't do this, here is the choice that increasingly is being faced by corporate counsel. I don't say there have been a lot of these cases in the Netherlands. I do say the corporate counsel is very mindful of the White Camp statute. And they face the question, should we settle in the U.S. using this Petrobras approach where we have a settlement class that waives the issue of domesticity, or should we settle in a White Camp action in the Netherlands where we might be able to get a, a very large global settlement approved fairly quickly? Those are the choices they're looking at in pending litigation today. Change is coming. I think I have ended early enough that I can have you tear me apart with all your bold questions. Okay. Anyone have a question? Okay. The, the first hand I saw up over here uh, was our friend from the Pomerantz firm, its chairman or managing partner. And uh, what is it you're going to suggest? Hmm? You were trying to try it, and the court said no. What, what you're, you're saying that Milan is not good law in your view, or? Well, I would still say the issue framed by Milan is the appropriate question. What is the rationale for the U.S. starting to become the uh, judicial resolution body for the world? I, I think it's clear that Justice Scalia, who, who wrote uh, the decision in Morrison, didn't want that. Uh, and uh, what is the rationale? I think you've got to 
cut the rationale back from every case could be settled in the U.S. to the friendly test that when there's a close enough connection that the U.S. looked like it was being used as a base for fraud, that's the basis that we can permit this under the statutory title of supplemental jurisdiction. So you're telling me that, that maybe Milan has been cut back a little, okay? It's always been discretionary. Yeah, so, and so just a pair ago, the court did, but not circuit court cases. In New Jersey, they did, so there is that. Well, you're just telling me there's even more of a possibility this route will be followed. Yes, we're, we're, we're doing this in practice. We have oh, I have no doubt you want to do it. I, I understand your interests. <laughs> okay. I think I saw Francis way in the back of the room. Sometimes lawyers overreach. They should have realized this. They should have realized this thing could explode, uh, but they didn't. There had been earlier FQ places, um, and also on the facts, and I guess you can, you can address this too, but on the facts, they said there was tremendous conduct in the United States because it was a subsidiary owned by National Bank of Australia that made subprime mortgage loans in the southeast of the United States. So they said all the fraudulent conduct occurred in the United States. The Supreme Court said no, the fraudulent conduct was the falsification of your financial statements and that occurred in Australia. You may have done really toxic mortgages in the U.S., but the crime was falsifying your financial statements and that occurred in Australia. So there was a legitimate debate of where the location really was of that case. Still, it was an overreaching case. Others, over here. Well, I think Israel has only done this for U.S. cross-listed stocks. I'm not sure that they've said they would do this for a stock cross-listed in London. You're discussing German courts now. I'm not quite sure how we got into Germany, but... Uh, because Israel is not interested in class action, so... Okay. Well, from your standpoint, you're an Israeli lawyer, as I understand it, right? From your standpoint, were you surprised at Tower Semiconductor, or did it strike you as the ob obvious result? Well, I mean, it's only about the law. Well, the law counts a lot. Yeah. Which, <laughs> Okay, uh, so we, what, we've seen what Israel's done. Canada did sort of the opposite, but they both wanted to get closer to the U.S. so there wasn't going to be real jurisdictional competition that could produce people trying to play a game as to which class they're in. Uh, and while they didn't intend it or didn't even think about it, that Israeli change now makes it easier to bring a settlement class in the United States because you're just talking about U.S. law. Okay, anyone else? I'm wondering if I have to call anybody. Okay, I've saved the American professors for a moment. Over here. Yeah. Um, I have a question with respect to your fourth uh, conclusion. Uh, a, a little bit louder, if you could. I have a question with uh, respect to your uh, conclusion on the fourth, where you say that in the end, global settlements in the U.S. may be both fairer and more fair. And I have a question with respect to be both uh, to more fair. And I was just wondering why. I, before, I wasn't talking about fairness. I was talking about the attitude of general counsel of American corporations that are being sued. They may say, we'd like to get this all wrapped up once, and we'd like to get it wrapped up early because if more of this comes out, it'll become a stronger case. Often you want to get the settlement before all of the bad facts have been discovered, and, and you can do that, particularly in settlement classes. So the question is, do we try to do a settlement class in the U.S., or do we try to do it in the Netherlands, uh, we don't know in the U.S. if we've got foreign claimants whether we can really get them in. We're pretty sure in the Netherlands they don't care about the fact that these people come from all over the world as long as there's at least one Netherlands class member. 
I, want, I don't want to get into the controversial area of which court will be fairer. No, no, uh, no. I, I just, well, I was um, a bit uh, intrigued by your uh, remark about the absent uh, uh, claimants in the, and how they were treated in the uh, Cortes case. Um, because I think You said you were intrigued. You want to disagree with it? Right. Yes. What, what, what is your position? I want to bring, bring you out. Yeah. You're uh, from Argentina? No. Oh. No, no. Dutch. 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 I've heard three nominations. You're Dutch. Okay. Dutch, yes. Um, yes. So I just wanted to respond um, on your remark about the treatment of the uh, absent class members in Fortis and how they gather. Well, less favorable. Class members do not know their absent class members, even if the best of notice might be given, because worldwide you're not going to be reading any notice that's going to be published in uh, Amsterdam. If you are a claimant in Brazil or the United States, it's not, one cannot assume, and I will not assume, that the absent class members will really know they were covered by this class until well, it gets pled as a defense. Well, actually, there, um, both in, in the Shell and in Converum case and the Fortis, are quite extensive notice campaigns. But I wanted to point out something else, and that is that I don't think the, absent, the treatment of absent class members in the US can be viewed similarly or the same way as the absent class member in the Netherlands. Why? Because the infrastructure is very different. In the United States, you have the contingency fees, you have the entrepreneurial lawyers that will take up the claim. In the Netherlands, you don't have that. So you really need an active members to come forward, to sign up, to agree with the fee, and if they don't do that, and take up also adverse cost risk, I, I then an action question. will not be put forward. So therefore, there, is, there might be a ground to have a disparity of treatment if the groups have different positions. Now, I'm not going to say anything critical of the Netherlands courts. I, I respect how they behaved in the Fortis case. I would tell you, when you see this as the U.S. versus Netherlands lawyers, everything in the Fortis case and in the uh, earlier Royal Dutch Shell case was arranged and structured by very entrepreneurial New York law firms. A well-known New, New York law firm, New York and Blooming Delaware law firm, Grant and Eisenhofer, went out and arranged with a hedge fund to be the litigation funder, an Irish hedge fund. This is a global story. They went out. Okay. Uh, an American law firm really put together the Fortis settlement. It had, it had one of the Stichtings that was in the original Stichting litigation. But when the global settlement came, Grant and Eisenhofer negotiated with an Irish hedge fund to get litigation funding and with an insurer to get insurance against fee shifting under the somewhat softer Dutch uh, fee shifting rule, which is a good deal softer than the British rule. And they were in the backdrop arranging everything. Uh, they'd done it before because they had done the Royal Dutch Shell case four or five years earlier. So this is not just a story of one lawyer here. There, there are large players who are doing this on a repeat basis. Yes, definitely. But the context is different, and that is the point I wanted to make, that when we speak of different treatment in the Fortis uh, context of active, we, we call it active and non-active claimants as opposed to absent and, and uh, lead well, plaintiffs. Okay. In, in the U.S., 72% of U.S. securities are owned by institutional investors, big mutual funds, big pension funds. They are very active and they monitor closely. And in fact, in the typical U.S. securities class actions, often a majority, not always, but often a majority, of U.S. institutional investors opt out because they find they can use the settlement as a starting point for their future negotiations. And if they were to discover that the White Cam action has been brought in the Netherlands, which they probably would discover, they probably would opt out to continue to sue in the U.S. They are big enough that they often get 50 percent on their claims, whereas uh, the typical securities class action settles for about 5 percent in the U.S. So, okay, well, thank well, you. I, I don't want to. Uh, you raised some points, and I want there, this is an early stage, and I think a lot of stuff will come out. More points will be made. I thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? The gentleman right here in the middle. Yes, uh, I'd like to go back to the question. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe you want to use a microphone, because I really can't quite hear you there. Why don't you hand him the microphone? 
Not your fault, I have just bad hearing. Thank you. I'd like to get back to the question I believe that Israeli gentleman was asking, and that is a worldwide settlement, you want to, you want to reach finality. I understand that. So if you get to a worldwide settlement in the US, you will have finality. But that finality will depend on the recognition of the US settlement in other countries. So I'm not sure eh, whether by reaching a settlement in the US, eh, you will get to that finality because I do believe there will be jurisdictions that say, well, we don't care about this US settlement and you can still litigate in your home country. If, if they reject comedy, which is a strong thing for any court to do, Canada did that in one case involving the U.S., but the settlement looked, wasn't a security settlement, the settlement looked very strange. So comedy is not absolute. There usually are some balancing factors to weigh in a comedy analysis. Are we, I see a hand way up back there. Is that, are your hand up? Well, well let's, let's uh, you're speaking very clearly, but I don't hear unless someone uses the microphone. Okay, I'll try to come closer. Hi, so we have uh, former Chief Justice Grunis here, so we had the very fun case, and in fact, at least in Israel, um, there is comedy, and uh, subject to certain rules, but which require just jurisdiction and no forum shopping, real connection, a U.S. settlement will be recognized in Israel, but to the best of my knowledge, a U.S. court, before approving a settlement of a foreign class, this is Vivendi, will check first whether the U.S. judgment would have a preclusion effect in that foreign jurisdiction. If there is no preclusion effect, it would not approve the settlement because otherwise the result would be that the defendant faces double jeopardy. So I think that would be one of the conditions that the U.S. court, to the best of my knowledge, I'm not the U.S. counsel, but this is the advice we have received when we have litigated that. And, and there was another case, of uh, a recent case of a data breach of a dot <laughs> If the case was litigated in Israel, there's at least a theoretical chance that a U.S. court wouldn't grant a effect to it because it might say for any reason. No, no, actually quite, quite the contrary. I'm the saying that to the best of my knowledge, a U.S. court, before approving a worldwide or a global settlement... But just a second. If the U.S. court is approving a settlement class of Israeli claims under U.S. law in the United States, that's already been approved by a federal district judge which has approved the Israeli uh, claims being settled pursuant to U.S. law at a particular price. There is no reason that settlement would be uh, overturned by a U.S. appeals court unless there was something very wrong with the settlement process. No, no, I'm, I'm, maybe, I, maybe I didn't explain it properly. I'm saying that before the U.S. court would approve the settlement, he would check on the basis of expert opinions whether the jurisdiction from which the foreign claimants are coming from, whether that jurisdiction recognizes in principle foreign judgments in class actions of a U.S. court. Uh, and that would be, by the way... And in Israel, that's true. And in Israel, that's true, uh, uh, in light of the very firm precedent. And in fact, you've seen, I think, in the U.S., con conflicting or contradicting judgments on the basis of the experts' opinion that were presented to uh, uh, the U.S. court. In one case, in Vivendi, there were opinions that led to the approval of uh, a global settlement. In other cases, and in fact, in one of the cases, in El Al Noir, the, 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 the U.S. court said, I will not approve the class of Israelis because I'm not I, sure I'm, I'm that pretty Israel... I'm confident that those who want to support that settlement in the United States will find the expert witnesses that will give the records of testimony. Uh, that may sound cynical, but I have some basis for that from experience. Yeah, but, well, in any event, of course, there, there is always the court that needs to check that and, and, and to see that whether that is correct. And the defendants, they have an interest that that opinion would be a genuine one, because if it's not a proper opinion, they would well, see, simply face a double jeopardy. What I would read your statement as telling me is that U.S. general counsels advising a U.S. company that is being sued for securities fraud both in the U.S. and in some foreign country, 
would prefer to settle globally in the U.S. by using supplemental jurisdiction than by using a white com approach because maybe it hasn't really been tested in the U.S. Maybe someone will find a reason that the white cam settlement doesn't deserve recognition in the U.S. I don't think it'll happen that way, but I see at least some risk. I, I agree. I think that in some of the continental uh, uh, countries, as was marked by... Uh, uh, I'm just pointing... I'm, I'm not familiar there with... There's two with choices, and I can see the question is, what are the considerations for which way to go? No, no, it, it was just to know that one should okay. be careful uh, acting for the defendants before agreeing to a global settlement without checking first that that global settlement would have a preclusive effect you, you in, in the various... You all are points. I'm worried whether I'm going over my time because there's one more panel. Is the, am I holding up the next panel? Is, is I, I'm chairing the next panel, so no, no, but... <laughs> well, well, you're as stopped, but the rest of your panel may want to get up here. Yeah, they, they are. Uh, maybe I'll take one last. I think I saw the judge have a question. Use, use the microphone. I think you, you answered it in passing. Um, one can see why defendants very much want a global settlement. My question was, if there's a settlement in the Netherlands uh, on a global basis, a pre-action settlement, as the Dutch law allows, include... A, a white camp settlement yes, or a regular? white camp settlement. And then the American members of that class They're start proceedings... They've never American members. They've always done it excluding the United States. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the white camp settlements to date have not included U.S. class members. But that's not a requirement under Dutch law, I think. It's, it was done because of a little bit of caution. Yeah, so my question probes the caution. If they included U.S. members, do you think a U.S. court would give effect to that, or would it allow the U.S. members of the class nonetheless to sue in the U.S.? Uh, I could see reasons why, if they said this is not like a U.S. class action because there was no lead plaintiff, there was no strong independent counsel, there could be risks in some cases. Uh, and for that reason, the people structuring white camp settlements have never put U.S. class members into it. They, there's an abundance of lawyers in the U.S. who will take their claims. Thank I you. really want to turn this over to the next panel. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.